Welcome to Tech Leaders Today with your host, Kathy Crossley. All comments, views, and opinions expressed on this show are strictly those of the host, guests, and callers. Now here's Kathy Crossley. Welcome to Tech Leaders Today. I'm here with Bobby Lynn, who is the co-founder of Veloso. How are you today, Bobby? I'm very well. Thank you, Kathy. How are you going? I'm doing great. Thanks. Tell me more about your company and what it is that you would do. Uh, I'm the co-founder of two companies. Uh, they sound very similar to one another. One is called Veloso. When I say that, usually people ask me, um, can you repeat it? It sounds a bit strange. Uh, so that's V-A-L-O-S-O, Veloso. The other company is Veloso Hub. So Veloso is an online video production platform. It basically allows companies or consumers to get a professionally made video right from their computers and it incorporates shooting, maybe talent, uh, storyboarding, post-production and media buying. So it's basically going through the entire video production process uh, all through the one platform. Uh, Veloso Hub, on the other hand, got developed kind of because as we were developing Veloso, we learned all this new technology where we realized that there were other businesses needing the same things. Because we had teams scattered all around the world, we were able to logistically provide innovative solutions through what we've learned to other businesses and sometimes even government tenders. And that's how Veloso Hub got created. Where around the world are you located? Well, we started off in Melbourne, Australia. And at that time, we had uh, one local developer. Because we were a startup on a bootstrap budget at that time, I figured it was probably best to recruit some freelancers, you know, due to the currency difference. It worked well uh, for a while. And then we had people in Macedonia, people in Ukraine, and people in the Philippines. After a while, uh, I went to New Zealand, got set up there. Then I realized, well, we need a location where we have more than just a couple of people. You know, we needed to have a lot more people, ideally centrally located. I'm actually in Macedonia right now where we have, we currently have a team of 18 very talented people, including developers, R&D, designers, and a few other uh, unique positions. So now we have a centralized team here in Macedonia with people in New Zealand, Australia, London, and the U.S. Wow, you are literally global. That's amazing. I've worked with a lot of teams around the globe for different projects that I've had, and the company that I work for uses English as a base language. So are you also using that as a necessity so that you can communicate across your teams? Yes, that's a very uh, interesting topic. I say very interesting just because obviously here in Macedonia, people do speak English, especially the younger generation, uh, because Macedonia gained its independence not too long ago. The young people are really you know, influenced by a culture that's sort of like the English-speaking culture from England and from surrounding countries in, in Europe. Even though they, they're capable in English over here, Macedonian is obviously the mother tongue. We've got scrum boards on the walls. We have an open office space. We have standing desks. We have sort of a very casual feel to the atmosphere. And, uh, you know, when we work, we, we work really hard. And when we have break, we, um, you know, try to have as much fun as we can. Uh, We've got a ping pong table as our conference table. And so even though we're in a very different culture over here than, say, to Silicon Valley, we're trying to create a very different environment to what they have locally here and something that they've possibly seen in movies or something that they've heard about, about these startups having great work environments. And so that's what we're really offering over here. And we've grown from zero people when I came here four months ago to 18 in a you know, short space of time. Yeah, coming back to your question, you know, what do we do about language? Basically, it's an English-speaking environment, and that's really international. We have a sales team over here that's targeting Germany, France, and England uh, just because of the, of the time zone that we fit into. And they speak with our lead generation team, which is in the Philippines. 
you know, everything's done in English and everything's with a video conference. It's really interesting how it's coming along and the route that we've taken. Yeah, English is definitely a key part to how we communicate and how we're growing. Well, you answered pretty much my next question, which was how do you attract and retain people? It sounds like you're doing a fantastic job. Is there anything unique in order to attract them or to bring them to the environment in any of the countries? Anything that is unusual based off of what you had seen in Australia and New Zealand? That's a really interesting question. And I think all the questions that, that you're asking are really, uh, it's making me think a lot. Yeah, these things are interesting to me just because I didn't really see these challenges when I was starting out. And so in hindsight, I feel I'm very fortunate to come from New Zealand. Even though the business got started in Australia, I'm originally from New Zealand. I'm from Auckland. So I've lived in Melbourne as well as New Zealand. And looking at the industries over there, I can definitely say that the enterprise aspect of the economy or, or of the country is at a very autonomous level than how things are over here in Macedonia. Speaking with attracting people, I think at the moment in New Zealand, Australia, and really all over the world, everywhere, there's a real shortage. But even though there's a shortage, attracting people becomes a little bit more challenging. I guess in New Zealand, it's more through networking, of course. Advertising, yes, it does help, but I've really gained our team through networking and the teams that we've got over there are just fantastic people through networks, through friends, through friends' friends and people that you meet in, at meetups, uh, at these conferences. It's quite unique how there are always people out there that are extremely talented at what they're doing and they just want to keep doing that and they want to be part of something that they really truly believe in. And so attracting people over there, I find, was just to have a really good idea and being able to share this ambition and drive and ideas and unique ways on how to go to market and coming up with strategy on how to achieve goals. Being able to do that with people that you meet and people that are referred to you or that you'll refer to was just how I attracted uh, the team that we've got over there. Uh, over here, though, because we've got more people over here, so we've had to, you know, find an office space that would fit our personality or the personality that we're trying to express. I've had to find a really open and bright space. And I was really fortunate because I, I went to see quite a few different places here in Skopje, Macedonia. There was really only one place that fit the personality that we were trying to portray. I was really happy that we found it. We were thinking about going to a designer to kit out our place to renovate the office. But actually, I went to my sister because she, she really loves design. It's not her, you know, she doesn't do it for a job. She does it for a hobby. I told her about it and I told her what, you know, what I was planning. You know, in less than 12 hours, I think she didn't sleep all night. Um, she basically just, you know, started drawing. And then in the morning, she presented this design for me and and that was it. Uh, that was very, very different to whatever they had over here. Anyone that walked through the doors, they could see straight away, wow, this is far different to what they've ever seen before in Macedonia. And so the design that we've got here is very homely, very technology surrounded. Like I said, we've got like a lot of standing desks around here. We've got a very cool conference room that we can just totally open up so everyone can sort of enjoy playing table tennis together. We've got a really unique whiteboard where it's actually part of the conference room. It's just glass with a bit of frost on the back. You know, the first few people are really crucial. We all share the same idea and whoever walks through the door, I think they say opposites attract, but I think in this case, it's more like-minded attracts. I usually get, you know, either their referrals or when they come through, our interview process is a bit unique. We invite them to our Friday afternoon food and drinks and uh, we just have a, a good chat, a good afternoon with them and that usually is how we meet people and find people that really want to be a part of what we're doing. Well, you could also do meetups there. If you've got a great space, then you can start hosting area events quite a bit and that can really increase your brand reputation there too. Yes, definitely. 
it's a coincidence, I guess, that you mentioned that because we are doing one in January. We're definitely going to do one, you know, to the size that I've seen them done in Sydney, Australia, or Melbourne. I think the meetings that they have here are quite different. Yeah, they're smaller groups and they're extremely specialized. So you don't really get a good mixture of people in the industry. Whereas like Melbourne, Australia, usually the meetups I've been to over there, they have a unique combination of investors, uh, entrepreneurs, and tech people such as developers. And I find, you know, if we can get a group like that together over here, which they currently don't, uh, we can definitely see some uh, unique changes in the industry over here. It sounds exciting. I love to hear these cultures really grow in the countries that did not have that startup culture mentality. There are so many concepts of the Silicon Valley spread around the world now. It's pretty cool to see them all and hear about their different cultures. You know, there's a very different feel to the ones in even the Bay Area versus L.A. So it's just really interesting to see what it'll grow to be like in your country there. Yes, definitely. You know, we're definitely going to try to upscale the community over here with our events. Are you looking to reach technology leaders? Hosting a podcast does have some costs involved. I'm searching for sponsors on this weekly podcast to simply pay for the hosting, editing, and marketing associated with this great podcast. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, please contact me through Twitter or my website, and soon you'll be reaching technology leaders around the world. Well, let's move to the topic of technology because I want to make sure we have time to discuss that. On the technology front, it sounds like you're developing quite an interesting approach on some technologies related to almost a service industry. So can you talk about the technologies you're using and what you're doing to really grow this market? Okay, so there are two parts to it because we've got Veloso Hub and Veloso. Now, what we're adding to this tech community, I would say that would maybe come more from Veloso as in the online video production platform that we've got, Veloso.com. Veloso Hub being the platform as it is, it's a unique idea. And it's working right now as well. It's really an idea that's in production. Having businesses being able to connect to multiple experts in their field of work, which is different parts of a video production process, but making that work seamless for the clients. And so they don't have to deal with file transfers, they don't have to deal with meetings, they can prove things off directly from the computer, media buying can be done at the same place, and also uh, if they do need some sort of assistance, we've got a Veloso success manager who's helping directly uh, in the platform itself. We're sort of bringing that connection that Upwork started, which is sort of having this one-on-one interaction so you're able to work with someone halfway around the world, we sort of bring that to another level, which is one to many, to make a process workflow seamlessly for the final product, which is a very professional and well-edited and well-shot video. But going a step further is obviously right now in the industry, people say that it's the age of automation. Coming to think about video production, it's still a very manual process. I mean, the software that we use, sure, it's all new. There's like 2016 Adobe Premiere or Adobe After Effects, which is called Adobe After Effects CC. But there are all these um, new versions or new releases coming out every year. That's all great. But there's still someone sitting behind a computer editing your video for you, or there's still someone carrying a camera around, going on location, doing the shot, or there's someone you know, coming up with a storyboard for you and, and things like that. Text to video is an area that, especially now that Facebook Live is really pushing video. A lot of people I know, even in the podcast world, are, how do I, in blog posts, how do I get this converted? You know, we've heard of uh, speech to text or text-to-speech, you know, we've heard of video analysis as well. Uh, Sorry, video analytics. And I think video analytics is extremely powerful and it's just interesting the way they go about it. 
I think Amazon started a while ago when they introduced machine learning capabilities to their services is that they could analyze video in a way where they've got tons of video, but they will just analyze like every six seconds or something. I guess maybe that was how they started, but now uh, for video analytics, they go frame by frame, but they don't actually analyze all the frame. They only analyze maybe a maximum of like 10%. Uh, and the way they do that would be they would analyze, you know, what's different between each frame. If you trim it down to that much, it's, it's actually not a lot that's different from frame to frame. And so they don't really need to analyze a lot. And that's really how they're um, sort of optimizing the, the resources for computation and, and uh, driving the algorithms. So uh, coming back to what we're looking at, we're currently working on text to video. And there are a whole bunch of issues there, so to speak. There's so, so many challenges and there's so many possible ways of doing it. Delving into these things and developing machine learning applications for what we're doing uh, really comes back to hiring people because I'm forced to hire someone that's 100 times better than me because they're experts in the field. But when we start working on it, when we start working on this uh, application or we, we're starting to work towards our goal, which is to develop a proof of concept, usually the way we go about developing these is in the language or in the way that it's familiar to that person that is building it. If we recruited, say, people that only know Python or they only know uh, how to use the machine learning services on Azure, our results are going to be quite skewed towards one solution. That might not be the easiest way to what we're trying to achieve. And I'm sure along the way we'll be like, oh, well, there are all these different challenges, you know, we're unable to use that particular library. I think it's about speaking to as many people in the industry as possible about trying to achieve this goal. And again, hearing people out, seeing what their ideas are, seeing how it aligns to your own vision, or in this case, to my vision, and be open to new ideas because, of course, I have to admit, I'm possibly wrong most of the time. And it's really great to hear what people think. And sometimes it's really, really crazy. And hopefully those crazy ideas can work. And so it's a bit about uh, opening myself up to other people, hopefully creating a space where they can open up to me as well. And not just sharing ideas, but pulling a team together where everyone can bring in something different to achieve the final goal. And the way we've gone about it is we're developing these small goals throughout the year. And every three months, we develop a, pr a proof of concept and apply it to our current uh, video production platform. Uh, we're working towards one now. I think, to be honest, text to video uh, will take a while. It will take more than three months. But we can start with the very basics. Well, the iterative process of development it sounds like you're using the agile methodology exactly the way you should, which is you iterate through, see what works, extend it further, not look for the big bang, but you're growing it as you go along. And I like that you're focusing your team not only on your clients, but also what can you build to move forward on different topics that can both benefit your clients in the future, but also look for potentially new markets. That's great. Well, I want to find out what is the best way for folks to get in touch with you if they have questions or they're interested in talking to you more about your services. Yes, definitely. Shoot me an email. Uh, my email is Bobby L. Uh, so L is the first initial of my last name. That's B-O-B-B-Y-L at Veloso.com or connect with me on LinkedIn think if you type in Bobby Lynn on Google, you'll see the LinkedIn profile. Great. Well, I'll put that information in the show notes so they can just click right on it to uh, get to you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Cassie, it's a, a real pleasure. And I'm so happy to have spoken with you. And thank you for asking me all these interesting questions. I hope to speak with you again in the, in the near future. I want to thank you so much for listening today. If you love this podcast, please do share it with your friends and colleagues. 
and please leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher because it makes a difference for circulation. For the show notes and other great info, enter your email into the mailing list at techleaderstoday.com. Thank you.